Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who um, who are attending this um, who is attending this uh, webinar. Um, first of all, I would really like to thank you all um, that you are attending the webinar and uh, Maria Laura and uh, our partners from uh, the Waters Channel, Abraham and Long, organizing this. Uh, this webinar. So um, today we talk about uh, modeling human flood interactions, which is um, part of the, actually this is my PhD work, research work. Um, I will give you uh, an overview of the theoretical background behind this uh, whole concept of modeling human flood interactions, and then. Uh, we will, I will uh, present a short um, case study, uh, just considering the time. Uh, and then we will, uh, I will reflect on the, 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 the work. Then we will have a Q&A session. So we start with uh, floods. Uh, floods are, flood is most, uh, frequent disaster floods are most frequent disaster um, on Earth. They uh, account so from 1980 to 1999. In terms of total number of disasters, they were um, the second uh, uh, most fre frequent disasters. And but from 2000 uh, onwards. From the year 2000 onwards, the last two decades, floods are the most common type of disasters. Um, and winter. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, in terms of impacts, not only in, uh, in frequency, but also in terms of impact, floods have the highest impact in terms of number of people affected per uh, disaster uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and no, in the last 10 years, and then also um, the second highest economic loss uh, uh, in the world occurred because of floods. And then these are reports from the uh, CRED and UNDRR. And then if we talk about flood risk, then what's flood risk? Flood, uh, so the impacts of flood are attributed to the, the hazard, the physical component, and the, the vulnerability and exposure aspects, which are socioeconomic aspects. But in most cases, flood impacts are mainly attributed to the extent and magnitude of the hazard. And if you see all kinds of, I mean, most majority of uh, flood risk um, management models, they, concede, they, they, they uh, usually consider the hazard component alone. So hydrodynamic modeling and uh, quantifying the, the flooding. And because of that, actually, because of that, the climate issue is also very important that contributes to the hazard. So the frequency and magnitude of the hazard is increasing so that the climate uh, change as um, climate change is very important topic. However, I also strongly believe that we live in very exposed areas, in, on floodplains, humans settle in floodplains, the, the wealth gap is increasing, um, poor people are uh, living in a very uh, precarious conditions in exposed areas. So, and also with the population increase, people living or settling in um, flood prone areas. So the socioeconomic aspect is also quite important. So the negative impacts of flood are not just because of the hazard component, but also the socioeconomic component, the vulnerability and exposure. 
Um, so considering that, usually, actually, what we say is we need to take out nature from natural disasters because, and there is a huge campaign nowadays, actually, uh, no natural disaster, because actually, if you really think about it, the, the natural element is the, the, the rainfall, right? Or hurricanes, but it depends on how we manage our system, our urban system, when it comes to the flood in itself. So the flood is not a natural phenomenon. Flood is not natural phenomenon. Flood is, well, runoff is a natural phenomenon, but if we manage that runoff, then floods will not happen. So the natural aspects, we should, we should be a bit careful on that because people think that, okay, it's natural, then it's, it's beyond us. No, we can do something. Um, one thing I mentioned in my thesis um, is of, I'm from Ethiopia and of, uh, a rainfall event that uh, occurred in the Netherlands, same magnitude, may not cause any flooding, but it may cause flooding in, in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, because our storm drainage management system is, is, is not good enough. Um, our flood management is not good. So these governance aspects, social economic aspects, the different adaptation and mitigation aspects are very, very important also. And if we talk about flood risk management, this definition of flood risk management from IPCC, which is very comprehensive, also uh, strengthen this idea. There are a lot of elements uh, several elements in flood risk management, designing, implementing, evaluating different strategies, policies, measures, um, and understanding a reduction of uh, flood risk, uh, flood preparedness, response recovery, and then finally the goal is human security, well-being, quality of life, and sustainable development. So it encompasses all the uh, the, the flood, the physical aspect, but also the human aspect and considering that we need to study both the physical and in terms of modeling in, we need to understand both the physical and the human element and the interaction between the two and considering that the human flood interaction which uh, the flood risk management is the core is a uh, uh, seen as a, a complex adaptive system. So just to uh, uh, give you a brief summary of a complex adaptive system. Complex systems um, are systems with a large network of interconnected uh, components with um, kind of no specific central um, uh, control and they have simple rules and using those simple rules the, the the components interact and then come up with or a new collective behavior um, emerges and this collective be behavior has a pattern um, and can be all, uh, all with all kinds of uh, information process can be studied so if you see here with the 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 interaction of the societal different aspects of the society right elements of society technological aspects and the natural um, uh, condition then all this interaction gives to some level of flood risk and due to the different change in the society technology and nature the flood risk level also changes so it, this is the emergent phenomenon that we call in a system study when when the components of this complex system, when they adapt through learning or through evolution and adapt in a positive way, right? So that they reduce flood risk in this case, then this is called a complex adaptive system. So a human flood interaction, a flood risk management system is a complex adaptive system. And if we, if we talk about complex adaptive systems, there are many different types of complex, uh, complex systems. Um, we can talk about um, 
couple human and natural systems. Uh, they call them chance or uh, social uh, ecological systems or social environmental systems, socio technical systems with the technical aspect. Technical artifacts are uh, pro, um, uh, give more. We give more weight in that case, and then we can narrow down, and then we say um, human water systems or human flood systems. Even narrowing down, this is just to. Uh, conceptualize the, the, the problem better, right? The system better, we need to narrow down. So in this case, we talk about human flood systems. So, and the system has components, subsystems, the human subsystem and flood subsystem. If we see this uh, image, the natural part is the, 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 uh, the hydrometeorological events, in this case, um, tropical cyclones or intense rainfalls that uh, uh, brings uh, flooding. And if we talk about technology, then we have different kinds of adaptation measures, uh, wet flood proofing, dry flood proofing, uh, different technologies, uh, hydraulic structures like dike systems, and uh, early warning systems uh, starting from monitoring up to dissemination of uh, uh, information. And then if we talk about the societal aspect, then we have the general public businesses, um, municipalities, emergency and disaster management, and social institutions. In this case, we focus a lot on social institutions also. So what are institutions? Institutions are humanly devised constraints that shape human interaction. So these are devised by humans, by us, so that we constrain and behave, our behavior so that we can survive, right? So these institutions are very fundamental in the social, economic, and uh, political makeup of human beings, and they define our interaction, right? Um, for example, just to give you an example, COVID rules now. So if the government says we need to put masks when we enter in a closed space, shops, malls, whatever, that is an institution. There is a constraint huh, that defines what somebody has to do and when, in what condition. And if not, what is the sanction? So if you don't follow that, you will be fined. For example, in the Netherlands, 95 euro. So these are humanly devised constraints that shape our interaction, how we behave. If you don't uh, stop on a traffic light, red light, then you will be fined. So these, these are institutions. We can mention more examples like norms, different kinds of norms. Uh, how we behave and uh, climate change agreements, the current agreements like taking place, uh, the COP26, for example, these agreements between countries. So all these are institutions, uh, sustainable development goals in institutions. These are not, they don't only affect individuals, but also between countries, between, so all these are institutions. And they are expressed through institutional statements. And these are uh, using the ADICO grammatical syntax is called ADICO refers to the, the actor, the A, the D is the deontic, what, what is allowed or not. I is the action, the aim, the, the, the action. C is the condition, in what condition, why? And O is the or else, if we don't follow that, what is the, the, the sanction? And considering this adequate grammatical syntax, all of them don't have sanctioning, some of them have sanctioning, some of them not. For example, if you consider climate change agreements, there, there are like usually handshakes and they agree, but some countries don't follow, nothing 
serious happens if you don't follow that. While, um, well, you can be kind of alienated politically or diplomatically somehow, but if you if you steal and if you are caught, then you will go to jail or you will pay uh, some kind of consequence, right? So some like criminal courts, these are rules. There are norms, rules, norms, and strategies. Some of them are strategies. People do things collectively. When many people do it, then others follow. These are like a word of mouth kind of um, uh, institutions. In flood risk management, uh, these institutions, different institutions, we can have policies, um, ordinances that shape the, the, the hazard, vulnerability, and exposure components of uh, flood risk. Uh, what are the main gaps we identified in modeling human flood interactions? There are two different types of modeling aspects, stylized models and system-oriented models. These stylized models, they use uh, differential equations. So they lump the whole area into one equation, and then there is no heterogeneity that, that my decision, my perception, flood risk perception, compared to my neighbors and area is not the same. So, but if you lump it, then you lose that heterogeneity, the different, um, these micro level uh, interactions or micro level behaviors. And institutions are not involved in this. And if you see system oriented models, current, most of those we identified, they consider flood as exogenous um, element of that system. So they don't consider it as part of really actual part of the system, but like, like an outsider. And because of that, they uh, simplify, uh, use simplified flood models. And also in terms of institutions, they don't have this, this uh, well-defined concept of institutions, social science theories, while they just use very simplified set of rules. And for example, here, what you see here is um, uh, a system diagram. Now, what was the research aim? It was to develop a modeling framework as much as possible, a very holistic one, and a methodology based on this framework, a methodology to build a holistic human flood interaction model that provide uh, the models that provide new insights into flood risk management, policy analysis, and decision making. And what approach we followed? The complex system perspective, complex adaptive system perspective. So we used system oriented models. So the, the, the benefit of this is that when you use system oriented models, you can have, you can, you can connect different subsystems, right? The flood subsystem in this case and the human subsystem so that you can address both subsystems with the right type of model. And then we define concepts. The, the importance of having a framework is to really define concepts. What are the most important elements that should be addressed in a uh, 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 human flood model? And then finally, an integrated modeling approach was used because, or has been applied, that is because now you will say system oriented models, we have uh, the human model, we have the flood model. Then we need to integrate these two and see how the system uh, feeds back between each other, the feedback between each other, and then how the systems, post subsystems evolve over time. So we came up with this Coupled Flood Agent Institution Modeling Framework called CLAIM. It has five elements. The first one, agents. Agents are um, representations. These are model representations of individuals or uh, composite actors 
or including uh, households or uh, 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 government organizations. These agents, they have states, internal states, like age or um, um, if uh, the gender matters, for example, for the model, then gender. If uh, socioeconomic conditions are important, then these kinds of, these are the states of, or for example, if it is a, a government entity, then the budget, these, that. So these are the states of the agent. And then agents have behavior, they have actions, they have interactions, they interact between each other, they interact with another type of agent. So all these, and the, the second ones are institutions. The institutions are what we mentioned before, using, they are expressed using adequate statement. And these are either written or verbal or um, formal or informal, or we can also define them as, um, as I said, rules norms and strategies. Actually, if we follow the institutional statement with the adequate syntax, then we define institutions as rules, norms, and uh, strategies, shared strategies. And agents, they, they um, create, change, or abandon institutions, while the institutions also influence agents behavior right agent and then we have the third one is the physical uh, 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 physical processes these are hydrologic and hydrodynamic processes rainfall runoff infiltration whatever uh, coastal processes um, uh, pipe flows like uh, 1d 2d kind of models surface flow all these that generate the flood any type of pluvial, fluvial, any type of flood, flash, whatever. And these are the physical processes. And then we have the urban environment. The urban environment, in this case, is we kind of split the physical process from the urban environment because first thing, we talk about urban environment because we talk about urban flood risk management. So specifically urban environment. And then, in an urban environment, of course, all these physical processes happen on that environment, but any other kind of um, hydrometeorological or geotechnical uh, uh, event can happen on an urban environment, landslide or earthquake, uh, whatever. But we don't address those ones, in this case, specifically floods. So that's why we kind of split them. In fact, if you think about the agents also, they live on that urban environment. So the urban environment is a link between the, the human aspect, that is agents, institutions, and then the physical processes, in this case, those processes that generate the flood. And then finally, we have the external factors. Two types of factors we identified here. One is the source of flood. This is actually connected to what I said before, the natural part of natural disasters. The rain, the rainfall, the hurricanes, we, these are, so just first, let me back up. So if you see this outer uh, uh, boundary, this is the system boundary. That means everything within that rectangle is part of the system and that system can change or or components of that the system can change or uh, do something within their power in terms of uh, policies or in terms of policy implementations measures and whatever whereas everything the external factors are those outside or beyond the limit of that system so the natural part, in this case, the rainfall or this, I mean, there are some technologies that alter rain pattern and this, but normally rainfall and hurricanes, we consider them as um, natural phenomena. So because we don't have that much uh, influence on them, that's why we put them as source of the source of flood as a 
external factors, uh, including climate change and um, uh, scenarios. These are included there. And then you have the external economic and political factors. These are like institutions actually, but external institutions. So for example, a financial crisis that happens anywhere would have an effect on a specific place. But that specific study area cannot have that much influence on the, that, that global crisis, right? But because of the global crisis, then budget cuts and this and that, all these things affect the work, flood risk management related work. Or um, national level policies affect uh, uh, city level or regional uh, uh, flood risk management activities. While the, uh, flood, if the, the regional uh, level uh, uh, system components, in this case agents, even if they don't want to follow this rule, or if they want to change it, they cannot because it comes from, let's say, the parliament. So it goes um, beyond that system boundary. So that's why these are like external economic and political factors that have effect on the system, but the system cannot really directly, at least, cannot affect or change the, the, the factors. And then if we talk about uh, modeling, then if you see this, the, the, the physical processes, uh, the source of flood, the external factors, and part of the urban environment, for example, the rivers, the channels, the topography, these, these all are part of the flood subsystem, and they can be studied using hydrodynamic models. Whereas the, the agents, institutions, and the external economic and political factors, and including where the agents live and what they do on the urban environment, that aspect is uh, the human subsystem and is studied using agent-based models. So agent-based models are computational models that simulate agents' interaction using uh, a set of rules. In, in our case, this set of rules are the institutions. Okay, so from that, what we do, how can we develop uh, a couple a, a ABM flood model? Then first thing is we conceptualize the system using the, the framework. So we define what, what are the agents, the institutions, how the urban environment looks like, what are um, the, the physical process, the important or the relevant um, physical processes. Um, uh, if it is a coastal flood, we don't talk about uh, pipes, for example, or urban drainage channels, maybe, because we have only coastal flooding or the vice versa. And then uh, the if we have any external factors, what are the external factors that affect the system? Then we build the agent-based model and the flood model, and then we couple the two uh, models, and then see the feedback between the change in the agent-based model, what is the feedback on the, or the effect on the flood model, and then whatever happens in the flood model, how does it change the human behavior? And how does this continue over time? And considering flood risk management um, phases, this study uh, address the recovery and prevention and mitigation phases, the long-term flood risk management uh, aspects, not the, sh the, the immediately before, immediately after uh, an event that is more, um, uh, operational level events, and they require some level of tweaking of this framework to work uh, or to develop human flood interaction model for this short term or operational level models 
we need to somehow adjust the the framework but that framework is for long term flood risk management and i will briefly give you um an example a case study um effects of formal and informal institutions on flood risk management in saint martin saint martin is um uh, a caribbean island uh, it's located in the hurricane belt uh, and uh, floods are the most frequent well hurricanes and then after hurricanes or related to hurricanes also sometimes or isolated events uh, hurricanes are the most um floods are the most important the most frequent disasters uh, of uh, uh, sorry in St. Martin. They have densely populated centers and they are located near, uh, which are located near uh, the coastline. It's a very small island. There is a lack of uh, sufficient stormwater infrastructure. And if you see here, uh, these are hurricanes that pass within 100 kilometer radius of St. Martin uh, until 2017 when we did this uh, work. And then after major, so St. Martin is a Caribbean island and the economy is based on tourism. It's very, very, very important. And if you see here, after Hurricane Louis in 95, the number of uh, tourists dropped significantly. And then you see after, and then it only starts to go up uh, after three years, it's the same level it reached there. And then another hurricane, Hurricane Lenny, which was a big category five hurricane happened, and then again goes down. So it is it, very important, hurricanes, uh, storms, but not only the wind, but also the flooding uh, aspect. And also, if you see here in, um, November 2014, they had huge rainfall, uh, around 250 something uh, millimeter in 24 hours. A lot of flooding uh, happened. And um, if you see here, so flooding in in, um, in Saint Martin, and uh, many people suffer because of that, um, and it's a very common problem. So, related to flooding, there are different policies. For example, existing policies, the Saint Martin Beach policy, which uh, uh, if you see here says. The strip of sand with the width of at most 50 meters of which the surface consists of natural seas should be should not have any uh, uh, building but if you go to St. Martin there are a lot of buildings just next to the shoreline so this is for example an institution it's a policy it's an institution and then if you consider also for example uh, this is in Dutch um uh building ordinance the building ordinance says that every house built in saint martin should be elevated by 20 centimeters um and then some proposed policies based on previous studies we made uh, only hydrodynamic models and what they did is that now they want to do is they want to um uh uh, they want to elevate everyone who builds house in certain areas has to elevate their house by certain level. So in some areas, so if you see this part, so the dark red ones up to 1.5 meter and then the light red ones are in the in regions in those light red ones up to 0.5 meter. So these are uh, institutions. So now we put them 
in a as institutional statement using the ID programmer. So if you say consider the beach policy, households must not build house any building within 50 meters of the coastline. If they do, they have to, they should incur some kind of uh, uh, fine sanction. But in St. Martin, usually they don't enforce that. So there is the, the, the sanctioning part is empty here, but it is considered as a rule because it's, it's a, there is a sanction, but it doesn't happen. That's why we don't write it. And households must elevate houses regardless of their location by 20 uh, centimeter. Uh, flood zone policy is from 0.5 to 1.5 meter, depending on where they are uh, situated. And then we include also this flood hazard reduction uh, strategy. So government implements flood hazard reduction measures if, for example, number of flood houses in an area is greater than some kind of threshold. Then we uh, develop, once we, um, using the claim framework, we identified the components, the agents, the uh, institutions, the physical process and everything. Then we, we develop a flowchart, a claim implementation flowchart to develop the models. So if you see here, um, let me just show here. For example, first we initialize agents, then estimate the urban housing. So in this case also, what we added is uh, there will be urban expansion. So based on um, proposed uh, uh, plans, we kind of know in which area uh, they plan to expand uh, in terms of urban development so we include that and that means whenever you put in principle when you put any house you are creating an impervious layer or imperviousness should increase within that catchment so we um, change the imperviousness of that sub catchment in this case and every time uh, a new uh, construction happens, then we do that. Um, and then that changes the input file of the flood model. And then the flood model feeds back. So that means whenever we run the simulation, then every time the, the, the flood model will run like a new model because it incorporates something more now. And the other element is if you see here, if they implement any structural measure, that will also be uh, implemented in the hydrodynamic model. So the next time the hydrodynamic model runs, it runs with all these um, uh, aspects. And then if we analyze, so what we did is we run such kind of simulation, it's a 30 time step, each time step is a year because most of the, the this long-term uh, uh, infrastructure change or buildings, whatever, they happen within, within years. It's not just the short time. This is the difference between the operational level and this strategic level uh, policies and also activities. So if you consider reconstruction or recovery and uh, uh, mitigation plans. If you uh, build a dike or something, you don't build a dike in a day. It takes quite some time, right? So that's why we use a time step of a year. So this is a 30 year time step, but what we did is that there may not be flood every year. So for example, in this case, there is no flood in the first year, second, year there is a flood uh, of 100 year recurrence interval then a five zero then in the fourth year so a five year recurrence interval flood so it, it continues like that so some years there is nothing and then boom a 50 year event happens so 
Then these are reflected here. If you see the beach policy, what we did, we um, play, we we exercise some scenarios, we created scenarios to see what is the impact of the beach policy, for example. So in this case, a beach policy, if there is no beach policy, that means distance from the sea, the shoreline is zero. So if you remember the 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 policy says that no one can build within 50 meters of the shoreline. But in this case, we say, okay, what if it's zero? Then this is the impact. The number of flooded houses, total number of flooded houses looks like this, up to 500, for example, in the uh, time step 19. And then building, this is the actual one, the current uh, condition, distance from C 50 meter. And then what if we increase that up to 100 meter? No one can build up to 100 meter. But then if you see these uh, flooded houses, the, flooded, the total number of flooded houses, the effect is not very significant because there are already many houses built along the floodplain, uh, sorry, along the coast. So unless those houses are demolished, then the impact is not really a lot. In terms of uh, the beach policy, even after this saying, okay, no one can build, of course, the number of houses that will be affected by the policy will increase or the number of potential houses but in terms of uh, impact in terms of number of flooded houses then it is not significant and then if you see the flood zoning and the building ordinance so just zoom a little bit here, for example. So this is flood zones. This is for the building ordinance. Normally, the flood zone is a very small area. So the uh, num cumulative number of households that are fo that follow or not follow the the flood zone, they are very small, up to two hundred fifty. While the because of the the Spatial extent of the building ordinance because it covers the whole area, the whole Saint Martin. Then the number of people affected by that is up to three thousand, right? And then if you see households that are flooded but followed the flood zone, um, the flood zone policy, flood zoning policy, then we are talking about very small number here we talk about huge number number of houses flooded but that didn't follow and if you talk about houses holes that are not flooded but because they followed the building ordinance then a huge number here maximum up to 60 houses in terms of the flood zoning but in terms of the building ordinance it reached up to 450 that means we are saving a lot of Maybe in terms of money, I'm not sure because this can be also uh, poor areas or can be said there are some very, very fancy houses in St. Martin. There are also slum areas. But if you see in terms of number of flooded houses, that's from the social justice perspective, if we consider just not monetary values, but everybody affected should be uh, accounted in that sense, then number of flooded houses the building ordinance affects huge number so if people actually follow the building ordinance then many houses will not be flooded so that is the message so our conclusion one of our conclusions is that the building ordinance is an existing uh, policy so if the St. Martin government enforces this policy properly, then they can reduce the flood risk significantly, up to 450 people saved here. While introducing a new policy, a flood zone policy, 
that as people, potential new builders, um, to elevate their house by 1.5 meter, which is quite a lot, um, that is, that's, that doesn't work. So what we say is that focus on your, the building ordinance, which is a very, just elevating 20 centimeters, you save significantly instead of asking people to elevate uh, um, 1.5 meters, from 0.5 to 1.5 meters. So this shows that with these kinds of models, we can have a new kind of policy analysis system, uh, decision support system for a flood risk management. So, um, if you need more examples, then I will point you to my um, my thesis. Maybe I will show that at the end. Uh, we also did uh, a research in uh, Hamburg, Germany. Um, in that case, what we did uh, was that um, we coupled also human flood uh, models, but mainly focused on adaptation measures like flood proofing measures, elevating houses, uh, also part of it, but also uh, weight flood proofing or just moving um, uh, valuables to upper floors and these kinds of things. Finally, advantage of the claim uh, model and the methodology to develop the hydrodynamic and the coupled modeling system, it, the whole thing provides a holistic and explicit conceptualization, holistic as much as possible, including most components of the human and the flood subsystem. It's very explicit in a sense that we address both subsystems directly and uh, it is designed to be very generic. That means in terms of uh, Spatial, spatially in terms of scale, right? Spatially, it can, we can have any, uh, we can develop this model, this framework and the model for any area. Uh, in terms of technical aspect, we can have any kind of agent-based model, we can, or any agent-based modeling platform. We can have any type of uh, uh, flood modeling uh, uh, method and then we couple them and then we have this. So the, the framework provides all the necessary concepts. And it provides flexibility in terms of model development. And then it provides also a very interdisciplinary approach. We, in, for example, in case of um, uh, Hamburg, we also added some uh, uh, psychological theory, uh, protection motivation theory, how people develop this kind of protection motivation uh, uh, towards uh, flooding. And you can have different disciplines and then, um, yeah. Excuse me, Yaren. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt, just wanted to point out that uh, we uh, have around like nine minutes left. So okay. if you could kind of- um, I'm just wrapping up. This is the last slide. Okay, fantastic. We'll get to Q and A after that. We have yes. a lot of questions. And what are the limitations of the the claim and the methodology? So, because of because it doesn't provide particular theory or scale or method, then um, modeling human flood to model human flood interaction. So anybody can use any type of theory scale. That's a little bit difficult to manage, but that is the the flexibility of it because it's very generic, but also that can be one of the limitations. In terms of uh, complexity, yeah, level of complexity, I don't define how complex this model should be or the model representation in terms of being holistic. What is the level of being holistic? That is, uh, can be questionable, but that's very highly subjective. Uh, if we talk about, conceptualizing and modeling operational level institutions. As I said before, we need to adjust the framework somehow so that both 
the hydrodynamic model and the agent-based model run simultaneously because you have to see the propagation, flood propagation, and how people move with the warning. So it's a, it requires a little bit different um, tweaking of the framework. Uh, it requires a large amount of data. That is uh, quite uh, a disadvantage because you have two subsystems, the human, the flood, and we need to have a lot of data. And in terms of also computational resource, uh, the simulations, they require or quite uh, some time. Um, that's it. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more, then uh, please uh, check my uh, dissertation. You can find it in the IHG repository or in the theory repository also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yadet. Thanks a lot for that great presentation. We'll now begin with questions. I'd like to request my colleague Long to please uh, share the questions uh, that we have so far on the screen. In the meantime, I would like to begin with a question of my uh, of my own, Yadet, if you don't mind. Uh, what is the um, uh, how much scope there is within uh, uh, the claim framework to take into account certain operational realities? such as let's say corruption such as the quality of you know governance municipal governance and all that uh would it would it be possible to take uh, to factor in these uh, uh, kind of variables uh, so as to say in future iterations and future work using this model yes uh, actually <laughs> we wanted to add that it's a little bit politically also sensitive aspect so that's why we didn't Included because we work uh, closely with the government uh, of Saint Martin, also part of the ministry. But uh, yeah, e there are other types of models, not human flood models, but from the social science um, domain, there are models showing a level of corruption. You can include it because it's a, an important institution actually, and uh, there is a way to also um, parameterize it so that you can model it. And yes, it is an important aspect. Okay, look forward to talking to you more about that at a later point. Uh, okay. Let's get to the audience question now. The first one is from uh, Melissa Melison. Uh, how, can the, how can the model address informal institutions like unwritten agreements, agreements that change depending upon specific contexts and actors? How big is the risk of oversimplification of institutions or human behavior using statements in modeling exercises? So kind of similar to the question that I had, I suppose. Yes. Um, informal institutions. Um, so, for example, these uh, word of mouth kind of institutions, these are informal institutions like, yeah, many people do it, I follow and then I do it because others are doing it um, it is possible to implement it as long as we know i mean so agent-based models work like this you have agents you have these institutions uh, in other agent-based models you see them as rules of interaction or set of rules so the set of rules you define them in such a way for example one is uh, if then else statements so if something, then this, if, if not, then that, you know, like that. So you can have all kinds of, let's say, possible scenarios to cover there. And then agents, they have this, we, we introduce randomness to just simulate the, the heterogeneity of agents. So they can choose whatever they want. When we parameterize it, that's how it goes. Then they say, okay, if this agent with that randomness selects one, then it goes to that then statement. So if then, right? So it goes to that then statement. So this is a bit more uh, technical aspect, but that's how you implement it. And then uh, how big is the risk of oversimplification? Well, this is, this is very difficult. This is what I said, it's very subjective also. It depends on data availability. It depends on computational resource. As I said, like this St. Martin model, 
it took uh, some three four months to run the whole simulation uh just just the simulation part i mean not the the model conceptualization building the model and whatever once all this is completed just to run simulations in around 40 or 50 machines i ran these simulations it took about three months so how the, all these things matter but then you need to consider always uh, sensitivity analysis and certain analysis these are important just to show also that okay i simplify something here but the implication of this oversimplification or whatever how you put it is this so you use this uh, sensitivity and uncertainty analysis to to tackle that aspect Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Aye Mayent. I hope I have pronounced your name properly. Uh, who asks if you have taken into account the modern concept of living with floods and living with water, uh, such as floating villages in Amsterdam and floating houses in Vietnam? Well, um, so agent based models you develop so they're huge. In this case, the, the the physical model that is physically based model, the hydrodynamic model, is based on uh, some kind of physics, right? The Navier-Stokes equations, 1D, 2D equations, that doesn't change wherever you apply this. Whereas the agent-based model is based on the, 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 the local situation. Who are the agents? What are the rules of interaction how do you so it really quite depends on this locality so if you talk about vietnam or 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 amsterdam the policies are different i'm sure uh people way of living different economic socioeconomic situations different so all these things uh will be in factor so the agent-based model will be different you know even if you apply exactly the same type of uh hydrodynamic simulation of course you cannot have because the topography and the system also can be different but even let's say these two are exactly the same you replicate but because of the change in the agent based model that's the human subsystem people way of thinking flood perception and this and that by the way in terms of flood perception for example maybe in vietnam people may have better flood perception than in the Netherlands, many people actually in the Netherlands, they don't know what to do if it happens. They just leave everything on the for the government. So the government, of course, spends a lot of money through the Ministry of Infrastructure and other uh, uh, institutions. They invest a lot of money and they do something. But yeah, local people, usually they don't know a lot. So all these human elements, they, they are important. Uh, Gopa Kumar asks if there are any independent outputs from ABM, or is it, uh, or is it that based on the scenario of human uh, subsystem, human subsystem modeled ABM, uh, the coupled modeling framework produce outputs of the resulting impact on the flooding scenario? Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure the question, but I, if I understand properly, so you have the agent based model, you have the flood model, so. Whatever happens in the agent based model, for example, if they, if some houses decide to build in a flood uh, prone area, and then when we run the simulation, there is a flood, then that house will be flooded, obviously, right? But imagine they elevate their house by one meter. And then that decision, and then when you run the flood model and then in that time, at that time, the flood generates, let's say, a 30 centimeter flood, then that house will not be flooded. So that house is not. But if the, there is uh, up to 1.5 meter, then the house will be flooded. So this depends on the two, how the agents decide or what do they decide and how the flood system looks like. That's if I understand the question correctly. That's um, my yeah. answer. 
thanks a lot, Yared. Uh, Mr. Gopakumar, if you would like to rephrase uh, uh, your question um, and put it to uh, uh, to Yared again, please uh, uh, do that in the chat box and we'll try to get back to it um, if we have time. Uh, Chef Shivalking asks, in the case of St. Martin, to what extent does the model take into account developmental developmental activities that do not adhere to the rules? Um, yeah, uh, we put a lot of um, yeah, different types of... So what we did is that, so in the box plots that I showed in the, in the results, these are different levels of enforcements and different levels of, let's say, adherence or rely, uh, um, uh, following the rules. So uh, you put different thresholds. So what if people follow, let's say, around 50% of them follow the rules? How does it, what, what, is, what will happen? If around 30% only uh, follow what will happen. But you don't specifically mention uh, or point out which ones. This is a random process in the model and randomly around 30% of them, they don't follow and you see the output. So, but you run this, let's say thousand times. So thousand times different random behaviors, right? And then you show the collective result in a, in that um, in the chart in the box plot so yes we considered a lot actually in that case thank you uh, thank you yared the, uh, the next question is from uh, alexis who asks what can be strategies or or measures to take for the management of the consequences of floods in underdevelopment uh, in underdeveloped countries like rwanda where poverty is the highest. Strategies or measures to take. Well, this, uh, yeah, this depends on uh, what you what you have, what kind of uh, flood, the type of flood is important. Uh, if you have coastal floods, you um, you implement certain type of measures. If you have Flash flares implement a different type of measure. So this is a bit too generic question, difficult to answer because all these things, um, I mean, the type of flare is very important. And then the, what kind of policies do you have? And those policies are dependent. You you develop policies based on the, the type of flood you have. So, yeah. Thanks. I will just uh, share the different screen for uh, the next few few questions. So please bear with me for a second. Yes. Um, Yara, do you see my screen and do you see some yeah. questions on the screen? Yes like before. Okay, fantastic. So, okay, the next question is from Alexander who asks, what is a uh, mechanism to integrate the urban expansion and watershed as it is shown in slide number 21? What is the mechanism to use the agent-based the agent based uh, parameter as input variable in modeling? Um, mechanisms to integrate urban expansion. So this, you can do it in different ways. We kind of simplified that part. We know from urban planning uh, department in St. Martin, we know the areas they want to expand. So we know the areas, but we don't exactly tell agents, okay, you're gonna take the next, this lot or that lot, but agents kind of choose whatever lot they want to develop. So they, they do that. But you can also have, Another layer of model that you can have, because the flexibility of this is that this the framework is that in in the human element you can have economic models, for example, econometric models that uh, define some income and socioeconomic aspects. Uh, also, urban expansion 
if you have, for example, cellular automata models that shows how urban development will happen, then you can also integrate all these kinds of things. It's, it's possible. Of course, it will increase the complexity of the model, and that can be a challenge or not, because sometimes these the CA models usually they run fast, but it creates a layer of uncertainty on all this uh, the already existing uncertainty. So that's possible. But um, yeah, in our case, in the Saint Martin case, we knew the area where they can develop, so we just agents kind of select those area from um, yeah and kind of already existing uh, um, file thanks uh taimur shah durrani asks if this model can be applied in a watershed in an arid region where the area is highly populated or urbanized and is hit by urban floods or torrents or flash floods yeah, I don't see any reason why it will not be very well. highly populated urbanizing is hit by urban floods. Yes, yeah, you can you can apply this in any in any area. Maybe so there can sometimes be. I mean, the framework. I'm talking about the framework. I mean, developing the model is another second layer, right? So first is the framework. So all these aspects are in any urban area and then if you go to for example a rural area maybe if there are other things important maybe you need to add other concepts in the framework then if those concepts can be included in the either in the hydrodynamic model or in the flat model that's perfect uh, sorry in the hydrodynamic model or the agent based model that's perfect you are done you still use two models but if that is will not be covered in any of these. For example, if you consider irrigation or something, then you need to have a, maybe a different model that um, takes care of the irrigation component. Then you have three different models, and then the framework is also kind of evolved in this case as a different framework because it has additional layers, and you should exactly know how those elements link between each other so that you, when you model that, or when you start to conceptualize, do the conceptualization, model conceptualization, then it's easier for you to understand this. So, but uh, yeah, it's possible to, to do it. Thank you. We'll skip a few questions in the interest of time. So we'll skip a few questions from our direct colleagues. I hope they understand, uh, such as Maria. Uh, Sylvia asks, besides the elevation building rule, do you, ta uh, do you take into account uh, the construction material, I suppose, in the modeling? The material? Uh, no, not in this case, because it's, it's not important for, for, the, for the problem we had. So you conceptualize the model for a problem. So first thing, the most important thing is what is the problem? Define the problem. And then you go to model conceptualization. Right. Question from Margie Sirega is, would it be possible to factor in the community awareness on the policy or the institutional arrangement? Also, what about the land usage change in the urban settlement? Is that also factored in? Yeah, the land use, that's what I say. Like when you, in this case, specifically only when you, when you change uh let's say pervious area into impervious area like by building houses then we consider that but if there are other types of chains also you can do that that's possible that's also what we said in terms of expansion and this you can have other types of models let's say uh, for example like cellular automata kind of models um community level awareness i mean we have the in the Hamburg model, for example, we have we considered perception, but individual level perception. But um, when you talk, if you talk about community level awareness, uh, yeah, maybe that's a little bit different. Um, it can be included in the agent based model, but I'm not exactly sure. Technically, I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Okay, 
Fair enough. Tang Lu asks, did you use the protection motivation theory to generate the behavior of local people towards flooding? Yes. Uh, if so, what are the challenges using this theory and what are your recommendations to improve it? Yeah, it's, uh, I really recommend to talk to a, a psychologist, uh, not a psychologist. Um, Sociologist? So, well, it comes from the psychological science, actually from behavioral science. So if you know anyone in that, it's very good to talk to them, especially those who work it on the protection motivation theory will be good because it started with uh, for, um, how to stop cigarette uh, smoking, for example, like that. Uh, how So developing a protection motivation, right? That's how it is. So, but then there are a couple of papers actually related to flood pro using protection motivation theory, uh, how to, how people develop that. And you can do it in different ways. Uh, you can see what we did, uh, but I know people also use, um, if you have the resource, best way is based on the protection motivation theory, you can have a survey and then you uh, can parameterize most of the elements of the protection motivation theory. And then you can use it you know, in the model, because anyway, when you model, you quantify things. Mm -hmm. So you cannot just use, I mean, qualitative stuff. In terms of, I mean, usually you kind of change to numbers, parameterizing to do the modeling. So it's good to include people who have experience on this or I mean, domain expertise, I would recommend that. Thank you. Uh, sorry, everyone, we have uh, exceeded uh, the time that we, we had promised, but if you don't mind, we would just like to hang back and um, um, and address uh, uh, the questions that have come in. Um, should take just a few uh, a few more minutes. Uh, I hope that's okay with you, Yared. Yeah, it's fine. So the next question is how to determine the boundaries of the system, uh, especially the institutional ones. Uh, well, that, for example, um, if you talk about parts of a city, then like a municipality, then you are talking about that specific municipality. Then uh, if you talk about then th what are the important uh, policies that affect that specific municipality. But if there is a regional, which is a higher layer now, there is a regional rule that affects but I mean, that, that's directly related to the problem you want to address, then you have to consider that. But that's an external factor. Whatever you do within your agent-based model will not affect or change the, that rule because that's beyond the power, the mandate of th that local uh, setting. So it is possible, but you should know exactly based on your problem, which ones affect uh, your system. And then, yeah, then uh, you, um, you, do, you continue with your model. If you consider the whole Netherlands, then, you know, it's a different thing. But if I consider I live in Delft, then Delft is uh, a small uh, city, then that's uh, something different. Next question sounds like it is straight out of your PhD defense. <laughs> Mr. Farhalen asks uh, if there is any way to validate the parameters or the architecture of the ABM. In the case of fish behavior, we can see the emergence of schooling behavior. Is there a similar way to see if the flood model correctly results in the emergent phenomena? That is the sum of flood damage. Yeah, uh, with uh, agent-based models, actually, this question is related to the agent based model because usually with flood models, you have historical data and then you calibrate your model, you validate your model. That's a kind of straightforward. And that's actually usually questions from hydrologists about these kind of models like ABMs. But in terms of the ABM, 
what usually we do is because people's perception change and this and that um we use expert opinions uh how for example in the synthetic model after i run simulations uh, I showed that to the disaster management people in St. Martin, and then they say, oh, this is a bit exaggerated. So then what I had to do is that I had to change the parameters. Uh, again, talking to them and then, okay, let's fix the parameters in a certain way, change the parameters, and then run simulations. And then they say, okay, this seems acceptable. So, but then of course, I have done a lot of sensitivity analysis with the parameters if they're uh, actually very important then you need to know more about that parameter maybe if you need to collect more data then you need to collect more data some parameters they are not um, uh, the, uh, some reason some parameters do not cause any sensitive sensitivity on the reason but yeah that's that's uh, actually how we did in this uh, in this case uh yorma paul romero asks um that in his previous study dr d uh, baldassare et al included the people's collective memory in, in his modeling of human flood interactions is the claim framework capable of integrating such factors such things as collective memory this is what i we said about these collective actions collective actions are a little bit different from individual levels. I know agent-based models on that. Um, but uh, we didn't consider collective actions. In collective memory, like collective recollection of past events, those kind of things. Yeah, if, but that is, I would say that is perception, actually. Like if you have the perception of flooding, if you were previously affected then you kind of know what you remember but people also forget for example in St. Martin the in 2017 there was huge event maybe if you followed the last webinar uh, Dr. Zoran Voinovich he mentioned that Hurricane Irma but the the previous big event was 20 years ago almost the same day almost like one day difference actually in terms of the 20 years ago many people kind of relax said you know it doesn't happen and this because in 20 years nothing happened so the first years you are very anxious and this and that but then slowly you kind of get used to the norm what they the normal situation and then Boom, after 20 years, extremely huge, uh, beyond category five, I don't know, because uh, one of the uh, comments I have with this Safir Simpson scale, category one, two, three, four, five, that's related only the wind speed doesn't tell about anything uh, else. So that is extremely strong hurricane actually. And it's, it destroyed the, uh, the the island mm -hmm. so this this memory related to flood it is very dynamic actually yeah. but if if you want to model it you can have it in the in the case of um, hamburg we have as perception but you can have some kind of graph or i don't know there are studies you can find and then see how memories fade and then you can include it from empirical studies, you can include that uh, in the model is possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the very last question that we have, and also the very last question we can possibly address given the time is um, again from Yorma, um, which is if the claim framework is capable of explaining how communities could be flood resilient. If communities? If communities could become flood, resilient like does it explain what constitutes flood resilience the framework is it, I mean, it doesn't explicitly define a, a resilience because uh, we address hazard vulnerability exposure we use that framework that uh, concept of flood risk 
but if you have adaptation measures and many people don't get flooded or the risk reduces in terms of uh, monetary value or in terms of number of flooded houses then that shows there is some kind of resilience and especially if over time your 550 years run or 100 year run and then you see that decline then that shows the resilience so i mean resilience these concepts are quite complex because everybody defines them in certain way in their own way and it becomes a little bit uh, to be honest complex so but uh, somehow resilience is related to also vulnerability also right so because we we uh, did a vulnerability analysis in uh, saint martin it's quite comprehensive i mean you cannot imagine how many things we add in that and that is beyond any kind of resilience definition or something because we added so many things and you can see if we say this area is vulnerable then it includes the resilience concept also behind it so this depends on how you define these things thank you we'll have to stop there uh, so we will uh long we don't have any more questions do we no we don't yeah okay. that's the last question okay thank you so with that we have come we seem to have come to the end of the proceedings thank you yared for your presentations and uh, for your patient questioning uh, answering of the questions and thanks to everyone for turning up in good numbers and for your questions and comments thanks uh, uh, thanks everybody for your patience because we ran over time a good 20 minutes over time uh, so as maria laura has uh, has already uh, has already put in, in the chat box uh, she has put certain links and those are the links on which recording of this of this session will be should be available uh, by tomorrow or, or uh, latest by monday next week uh, so these are links on the water channel website uh, and on the IHC website and the IHC YouTube channel. Uh, we'll see you at the at the next webinar, which will be on December 9th. Uh, and the speaker will be Dr. Rosh Rana Singhe from IHC, who's uh, um, the coordinating lead author of the IPCC report that we are all familiar with. And uh, in this webinar, Dr. Rana Singhe will summarize the key findings of the report on sea level rise and how 33 different climatic ha uh, hazards are projected to change in uh, different regions of the world. So that will be on December 9th. Uh, and until then, thanks again, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you for you, for you too, uh, Abraham Long and uh, the Water Channel, and Maria Laura and Aichi for organizing this. Thank you very much. And thank you yeah, for the audience. Have, have a nice day, everyone.